So, of course, in Genesis chapter 1, we've got this great story of God's creation. And this is one big stumbling block for people out there that don't believe in God. You know, the atheist, the fool that said in his heart, there is no God. They'll try to tell you that, no, 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 this is just a fairy tale. This is just for ignorant people who couldn't understand, you know, science and, and the way things really happen and how we evolved from monkeys and how that's the intelligent way of thinking is that we evolved, you know, nothing exploded. There was this great big explosion and, and that's where everything came from and it rained on the earth. And then over time, because if you just give enough time to the rain and to the rocks, you know, maybe lightning strikes it or something, then all of a sudden there's life. And then that life just becomes all kinds of other things. Like that's what the fool says. They have a hard time accepting and believing that the God's word, what he says here in Genesis chapter 1 is actually true. But I'll tell you what, this is God's word. God's not a liar. God has told us the truth. He, has, he, didn't, he didn't give Moses Genesis chapter 1 because Moses just was so ignorant he couldn't co possibly comprehend something so complicated like evolution. That's nonsense. If, if, if God decided to use the evolutionary process and the Big Bang to create everything, he would have told us. It's not that hard to understand. It's not some complicated thing that, you know, these ancient people had no way of understanding that. That's, that's baloney. Look, it's very simple, but it could have been extremely complicated. Either way, this is the way that God did it, and this is what we have to do for us today. Now, the reason why I'm even bringing this, this point is because God has an incredible design for all of his creation. And you notice, as we're reading this, it says that you know, when, he, when he created the trees and the herbs, the seed is in itself. So there's already a conundrum for those that want to exclude God from the creation process. There are so many things that, are, that are, have a symbiotic relationship, right? I mean, in order for the plants to even grow and to pollinate and to reproduce, hey, they need to have insects. They need to have other things going on. So if, in order for evolution to be true, all of this stuff would have just had to happen at the same time. And it's nonsense. There's no way statistically that could even happen just by chance, let alone life being created by chance. Life is not something that's just, it just happened. That it's just some, some coincidence that, well, we're here, so we know life was created, but it wasn't actually created by God. It just happened. No, life didn't just happen. God made it. God created it. Now, this is an extremely important fundamental to have for what I'm preaching about this morning. I'm not preaching about the creation. What I'm actually preaching about this morning, and it's going to be a short series on healthy living. And the first part portion I'm going to be dealing with is eating, the food that we eat in, in order to, to live a healthy life. That's the subject matter for the sermon this morning. And the reason why I even bring all this stuff up is because the, the modern approach, the Western modern uh, approach to health, to, to you know, medicine, to all kinds of things like this, it comes from, it stems from foolishness. It stems from an evolutionary approach to, to how we are here and how we're created and how the body works and all these other things, they have only in their mind is, is the, the fundamental principle of an evolutionary process without God. And this is a fundamental flaw. Now, I'm not saying that all doctors get everything wrong all the time. No, of course not. They apply other real science to their belief. They apply things. They, they can do some tests and see, you know, okay, we introduced this. We can, we can introduce this to the body, and this is the reaction. Look, that, and that's great. And you know what? I'm not here to say that all doctors are bad, so don't, you know, but I am going to be very critical of a lot of practices and things that are done and, and the wisdom of the world that's going to teach you on, on how to diet and, and all these other things. So just keep that in mind. I'm not, it's not just a blanket statement over every single person. And you know, a lot of times people will hear criticism of current um, modern medicine and they'll say, no, but you know, my doctor's a good person. He's a great guy. And I'm sure that he is. You know, there, it's not that he's a bad person or his, his intentions are bad. It's that he's just been deceived. You know, people just, they, they've been deceived into this way of thinking. They've been taught a certain way, and their intentions are really good. And we'll get into this a little bit more when we deal with, uh, with treating disease. And I'm not sure if I'm going to get to that in this sermon or not. Probably not. But when we go into things like, like cancer and other, and other research and stuff like that, people are well-intentioned for the most part. Obviously, there's bad people. And it's, and it's a lot of the wicked people were, that have deceived the good people. But... Um, 
just, I just want to keep that in the back of your mind. I don't want to get too far off on that just yet because we start off in Genesis 1 and we see the things that God created. We see the way that he made it. God has an incredible design for us. And the more you study plants, the more you study the human body and biology and the way things work, you will realize that God has an extremely complicated system set up. Let's just talk about our body individually. We, our body is made up, of, consists of all these different organs, right? You have your heart that pumps the blood through the body. You have your stomach that digests the food. And, and the whole digestive process isn't just the stomach. You've got your mouth starting with the saliva and the teeth, chewing it up, going down into your throat. And look, this is an extremely complicated process with all of these different things involved in your body to process food, to give you the energy, to give you the nutrition that you need in order to keep going. God has made us, if you want to think about it as a machine, an incredible machine. You know, we could think about machines that we make, right? God has designed us. Now, I know we're not exactly machines, but you think about it that way. We have all these different components. We have a brain that controls what the rest of our body does. We, ha we have so many things. I'm not going to get into all of the amazing creation that God has in our bodies, but going, approaching our health with this understanding, with knowing that, hey, God has given us all of the means to self-sustain, God has given our body ways of dealing with things that shouldn't be in our body. For example, um, when something is introduced in your body that shouldn't be there, your body will try to fight it off. We think about something even as simple as getting some dust or some dirt in your eyes. You know, God has given us eyelashes to protect our eyes, to keep that stuff out. But then what happens if something gets past that first level of defense? Your eyes will actually start to water, to flush out what's not supposed to be there. When people get sick and you cough, right? The cough is your body trying to expel what's not supposed to be in your body. And it could be caused from people will say, oh, well, that's just because you have mucus and other things. Well, yeah, where did the mucus come from? The reason why that's there is because your body is actively fighting off the, 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 the germs or the, you know, the disease or whatever it is that's not supposed to be in your body. Your body's fighting that off. And God has created these mechanisms, in order for you to work, in order for you to survive, in order for you to, to continue from day to day. So the approach, the fundamental approach, and this is a major point I want you at least to walk away from this morning. If you didn't have this to begin with, when you consider your health, when you consider everything that you do, we need to have this mindset that God has designed our bodies a certain way. And the best way for us to be healthy is, an, is for us to just to make sure that the body is doing what it's supposed to be doing and facilitating that to the, to the way that God has designed it. And not to hamper necessarily what the, bi what the body is doing, but to promote the, the good health. Um, <clears throat> so let's, let's get into the, more of the meat of the sermon. And that's just, this is just a mindset. So we take the mind, I take the mindset of, a, you know, some people might call it like a naturopathic. It's just a, a natural way. And, and, you know, I'm not crazy about the term, but it, it's, not, it's not that big of a deal. I don't really care one way or the other on the term. The, the whole concept is just that your body was designed and created and everything has a specific purpose. Nothing is just, oh yeah, we could get rid of this. You know, doctors in the past have had this mindset of like, oh yeah, you could just, oh, you're having a problem with your tonsils? Well, we'll just cut them out. You can just get rid of that. Oh, your appendix, oh yeah, we'll just get rid of that. Now, again, you take this with a grain of salt because there are times, there are extreme circumstances that I believe that people can get injured or get some real serious disease or something can happen to where maybe the best, with our knowledge, the best, the best option we might have is to perform some type of a surgery to remove something, okay? I'm not against all forms of surgery all the time in every situation, but what we have to understand is that we can't just look at things in, in an evolutionary way of saying like, oh, well, the tonsils, they're not really that important anymore. You know, the body's adapted other ways to deal. No, look, it is, if it's in our body, it's important. It's not just worthless. It's not we just cut it out. Let's try to deal with the actual issue and, um, and not just the symptoms or not just the point. And, and you know, that's another, another problem with dealing with illness and disease. You know, someone might start to get a fever and people start to think, oh, well, the fever is the problem. No, the fever is not the problem. The fever is actually the body working hard to get rid of what you do. So you don't, your, your first knee-jerk reaction isn't just, well, get rid of the fever by taking Tylenol, by taking drugs just to get rid of the fever. No, 
wrong. That's just going to mask your symptoms and prolong your disease. We need the body to be working at its, at its best, at its optimal performance in order to get rid of what's going on. Because I'll tell you this right now, God has designed things way better than we can ever do ourselves. If, we, if it was left up to us to fight disease just completely on our own, we would not have any clue how to handle it the way that God has already and, and what he's given our bodies in order to fight off these things. But let's get, in, let's get into the diet because they're all related. And that's why I keep on jumping around a little bit with the medicines. Of Everything is related when it comes to our health and it comes to disease and it comes to the food that we eat. You've heard that phrase, you know, you are what you eat. That's true. The things that we consume become a part of you and your body uses that and distributes. It literally breaks down the food that you eat and sends the nutrition and, and expels the waste, but it literally becomes a part of your body. And because of that, that's one of the reasons why a lot of people are getting sick is because they're not getting, they're not eating the proper food. They're not getting the proper nutrition and your body is not performing the way that it ought to be at its optimal level. So it's more susceptible to, to be being sick and getting sick longer and not being able to fight off the, the disease when it comes your way as it would if it was performing optimally. You think about a vehicle, right? I mean, there's certain cars, there's certain engines that are designed to run off of a specific fuel. Right, a specific type of fuel. And if you put in a, a lower grade, a lower quality stuff, or you get put in fuel that's been sitting around for a long time. We just had this problem with our quad, right? We've got, we've got a, a, a four-wheeler, and I took it out hunting, and I was trying to figure out, man, what's the problem with this thing? I got a new spark plug. It wasn't running right. The thing was just backfire and doing all kinds of stuff. It was dying out. It was just not doing a good job. I took the carburetor out, cleaned it. Thing is all mechanical stuff. The problem was I had old fuel in it. The, the fuel had gotten old and bad. And as soon as I put in just new fuel, I put in the right stuff, thing ran great. And you could use that analogy the way when we put in food. You know, if we put in a low quality, bad food, and we'll get into what's bad and what's good a little bit. But if you put in stuff that's bad, hey, you're not going to be functioning right. You're going to be a lot more susceptible to getting sick. Your body's not going to be working the way it was designed to work. So in order for our body to work the way it's designed to work, we have to ingest, we have to, to eat the things that God has designed for us to eat. So you're in Genesis chapter 1, look at verse 29. The Bible says, And God said, Behold, I have given you every herb bearing seed, which is upon the face of all the earth, and every tree in the which is the fruit of a tree yielding seed. To you it shall be for meat. And meat there just means for food. It's for you to eat. So God has given us, starting in Genesis chapter 1, he says, look, these plants, these trees, they yield fruit. And it doesn't necessarily have to be the fruit that we think of like an apple or an orange, but the fruit of a plant is what it brings forth. So it could be a corn stalk brings forth corn. The corn would be considered the fruit of that, of that plant, right? So all of the things that God has brought forth for us to eat. Hey, these are good. And if you notice, after everything that God created, it said, and God saw it, and it was good. And at the very end, after everything else, he said, God saw what he had made, and it was good. And at the very end of the chapter, it says in verse 31, and God saw everything that he made, and behold, it was very good. The things that God makes are very good. They're good for us to have. They're good for us to ingest. See, the problem is man comes along and tampers with what God's done and corrupts it, and then all of a sudden it becomes bad. But the stuff that God has made, so a real general principle for eating healthy, if you stick just with what God has given us, just with what God has made, you're going to do well. Because what God made is good. The things that God has given for us is good. So vegetables, now in, in the beginning here, God had given man a vegetarian diet. It was all just the fruit of the, you know, the, the, the plants that, that produced their fruit. That's what man would eat. But this was in the Garden of Eden. This was before even sin had entered in. And um, for a long time, this is the way that God had designed it. But if you want to flip over to Genesis chapter 9 real quick, we're going to see that that changed. That's not the way that God, that, that God has it set up right now is that we all have to only eat vegetarian. Now, if you want to be a vegetarian, that's fine with me. There's nothing sinful about choosing just to eat vegetables and fruits. That's fine. Go ahead and do that. And you know what? If you're eating what God made, great. 
You're going to be way, way better off than the guy that's, that's eating McDonald's every day and you know, eating that cheeseburger from McDonald's. And I'm not against cheeseburgers, but if you're eating McDonald's every day, the person that's a vegetarian is going to be way better off than the, this other person. So there's nothing wrong with that. But I need to show this because some people think that eating meat is a sin and that we should just be vegetarian. And that just shows a little bit of a lack of understanding from the Bible. I'll show you this real briefly here. Um, there's entire sermons I've preached on this in the past, but um, I'll touch it real briefly. Nine, chapter 9, verse number 3 of Genesis. The Bible says, Every moving thing that liveth shall be meat for you. Even as the green herb have I given you all things, but flesh with the life thereof, which is the blood thereof, shall you not eat. So this is after the flood. When Noah gets off of the ark, God says, Okay, look, things are a little bit different now. You used to just eat the, the plants. You used to eat the vegetables. You used to eat the fruit. Now I've given you every animal to eat from. Go ahead and eat. Every animal was at this time was clean from it. It was fine for them to eat. Anything that moved, hey, that's meat for you. The only restriction he said is you can't drink the blood. You can't eat the blood. Like don't, and, and it doesn't mean a rare steak. Okay, what's in the meat of the steak is not blood. It looks like blood. You call it blood. It's not blood. Okay, blood is what goes, pumps through the veins. And he's saying, you are not allowed to eat the blood. So that's where the life is. And you know, there's, a, there's a whole other context and everything else regarding that. But God said not to do it, so we shouldn't do it. But other than that, that's the restriction. Of course, Moses came along and then he added some extra dietary restrictions. And he called certain animals clean and certain animals unclean. And he said, okay, you can't eat from these, but you can eat from these. And that was during the time of the Mosaic Law until Christ. And after Christ came and died and rose again from the dead, that had changed again because the priesthood being changed, the Levitical priesthood, then there is also made some changes to the law. And again, I'm not going to get too much into detail about this. If you're really interested in this topic, I have preached other sermons on it. Ask me after service and I'll let you know where you can find this information. But in Romans chapter 14, if you'd like to, to turn there, you can. Romans chapter 14. In verse number one, just, just real briefly, just showing you in the New Testament that that law has been um, disregarding eating vegetables. This is more just re regarding eating vegetables. But um, you can look in Hebrews also explains, you know, the book of Hebrews, if you want to understand a lot of the differences between the Old Testament and New Testament, read the book of Hebrews. Because it was written to the Jews, to the Hebrews, right? To the physical seed, so that they could understand all the differences and stuff and the changes that were made because they were obeying the Mosaic Law and all this stuff. So the book of Hebrews as an entire whole, read that whole book and you'll see a lot of the changes that were, that were made to the law. The fulfillment that Christ had made. And um, also in the book of Acts, we see Peter had the vision of all the unclean beasts and God said that basically he had cleansed what God has cleansed that call thou not unclean so he's saying look when God has cleansed this it's not unclean anymore so those unclean animals no longer are unclean for us to consume it was it was all for a purpose of, of showing a greater truth but um, Romans 14 verse number one the Bible says him that is weak in the faith receive ye but not to doubtful disputation. So, you know, if someone's a, a new believer and they're kind of weak in their faith, oftentimes new believers will have concepts or beliefs or doctrines that are a little bit screwed up. They're not quite right on everything. But he says, that's fine. You know, if someone that's weak in the faith, receive them. Not to doubtful disputations. You know, you don't have to be fighting about over every little thing. And he says in verse number two, for one believeth that he may eat all things... Right, as we just already, uh, as I was explaining, that we can eat all things. Another who is weak eateth herbs. So he's saying here, he's, he's, he's spelling out the person who's weak is the one that's only eating herbs, the one that's not, that, that thinks that they can't eat all things. He's saying the one who, who believes they can eat all things, he's not the weak one. The one who thinks that all they can eat is the herbs, all they can eat is a vegetarian diet, that person's weak. But he says, let not him that eateth despise him that eateth not. So you don't have to hold that against them. I mean, look, if that's what you believe, fine. You know, I, 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 it's not correct, but that's fine. And there's nothing wrong with that. I'm not going to argue with you about it. You know, go ahead and eat the veg. You know, be a vegetarian. That's fine. But don't, don't condemn, you know, and I won't condemn you for being a vegetarian, but the Bible also says not to, and it says, and let not him which eateth not judge him that eateth for God hath received him. 
So saying, you know, okay, you think you need to be a vegetarian, fine. But don't say that I can't eat meat either and just be judging me over this. He's saying, that's fine. We're not going to argue about this. It's not that big of a deal. But I just wanted to point that out that it is, it's referring to the person who can eat all things as being the one who's right. You know, that that's not the person who's weak. But that's fine. So we have been given, according to the Bible, the fruits and the plants and the vegetables, which God hath made to be food for us. Also, animals. So meat, you know, like I love eating beef and hamburgers. I said hamburgers. There's nothing wrong with that. You eat meat that, that comes from an animal that God has made. Okay. These things are great. Everything that God has made is good. The problem comes in, and what we see a lot more recently, which is, which is pretty new to our current time and day and age, is with the advance of our science and, and men thinking they've become so smart, we have be, you know, there's been introduced this engineering into food where man has now been genetically modifying the food that we eat so that, you know, in, in order to make improvements, basically, is the concept, right? So the, the, the thought process goes like this. We have hungry people in Africa, right? It's always there's hungry people in Africa or in these other third world countries. And look, is that a problem? Yes. So they say, well, we need to produce more food with the crops that we plant. I mean, we only have so much space to do this. We need to produce more. So how are we going to do that? Let's, let's get in here. Let's study the DNA. Let's study the way that this grows and try to, and try to make changes to it to, to make it behave in an unnatural way, in a way that we tell it to behave. And so they, they make these really big you know, tomatoes or whatever it is. And then they also say, okay, well, we lose a lot of our yield due to insects and these, these pests that come in and they eat our crops so we don't get as much crops as we would have if these pests weren't coming in and doing this. So they introduce, you know, they genetically modify their seeds to have pesticides already as part of the seed. And they say, okay, this is going to repel the insects from, from eating this crop and we're going to yield all of it. We're going we're to harvest everything that we plant because none of the pests are going to eat it. Now, when man starts to do this, you start messing with, with God's creation. There are unintended consequences because man is not as smart as he thinks he is. God has everything in place. And see, we are starting to reap the effects of this now. You, you know, people wonder why, why is cancer such a problem? Why is Alzheimer's? Why are all these things become issues and it was exploding to where so many people are getting this stuff? I'll tell you the reason is because of the diets, because of what's going into our food. Now, I'm not going to say it's that 100% of the time and every single sentence is because of what you eat. No. But there's a high correlation and, and, and it's, uh, it's, there's no doubt about it in my mind. When man goes in and tampers with God saying there are unintended consequences because we don't understand the way everything works the way that God has designed it. And you also have to think about, well, what about the insects? Yes, I know that they're pests. I mean, I know that, that, that you know, there are times when they can come in and eat everything that you have. And you know, we try to control that. In our, you know, when we have a garden, you have the caterpillars come in, they eat stuff. And it's like, man, you know, we, you know, they're eating everything. And there is a balance that you want to be able to, to strike. But we ought to, again, approach that with God's method. Because God has created everything to, to balance itself out. There's natural predators for, for, the, for the insects. But as soon as you start trying to get rid of one, you know, they had a problem with the bees. And now all of a sudden, there's, there's, you know, it's causing all kinds of problems over in California and, and in other places. But, um, you know, it's because man's not quite as smart as he thinks he is. But this genetic, genetic modification, when you ingest this food, your body then, as I said, mentioned earlier, you are what you eat. So the food that you bring in now, it's not exactly the same as the way that God created it. So the way that your body deals with it is going to be a little bit different. And it might be tricked. Your body can actually be tricked into thinking, okay, this is good, when there's actually something harmful now that's been introduced into it, like the pesticide, that your body is going to try to consume and ingest as nutrition because it thinks that, hey, this is a good thing. Because what man has done by genetically modifying it has deceived the body into thinking that, hey, this is something good for me, and then it's going to use it as nutrition for the body when you're actually ingesting a poison. Right? A pesticide is a poison. It's poison for insects. But just because some you know, government official somewhere said, okay, this is safe, you know, it doesn't make it safe. 
I mean, you could, you could run tests on it, but it still doesn't make it safe. And you've got to remember there's also, you know, the love of money is the root of all evil. And if somebody wants to get a stamp of approval hard enough on, on something that really isn't safe, but just to say that it's safe, they can get it done. It happens all the time. People get bought out. There's corrupt politicians. There's corrupt institutions out there that, that are willing to, for, for the love of money, just to, to say that this is safe and bring all kinds of disaster on, on the unassuming public. But one of the easiest things to do, we're talking about healthy living and healthy eating. GMO food, is, is this genetically modified food is not good for you. It's not good for the body. And again, I didn't bring all the stats and statistics for this. I'm trying to do more of this just from the Bible. Hey, look, if we see that what God made is good, let's eat what God made. Okay, let's see. Let's use what, what God has made. And look, all the statistics are out there. I've been doing this research on this stuff for a long time, just individually. I'm not an expert on, on all of the different genetically modified organisms and, and everything that's being done, but I've done enough research for myself personally to satisfy my own. Um, and and I, don't, look, I don't expect you just to say, oh, okay, well, you've done the research, so I'm just going to believe you. No, look, look it up for yourself. But the whole point of this, ser this sermon this morning is to say, okay, whether you think it's good or not to eat GMOs, let's just go with the Bible. If the God made something, it's good for you to eat. And this is what I'm promoting. Let's eat what God has given us to do because what God made is very good. God has made the design. But if you want to avoid this stuff, the first thing you need to start doing is checking the ingredients list. If you go to a store and, you, and you're wondering, is this thing good for me? Is this healthy for me? A, a general, very good rule of thumb if you start getting ingredients lists that are like this long, I'll tell you right now, it's not good for you. It's not going to be good for you. When you start reading it and you're like, that looks like something from chemistry class, <laughs> is the name. That's not something that God made. And the reason why it looks like it's something from chemistry class is because it is. Because they're using the, 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 the terminology for, for these, these, these things that have been invented. It's mostly preservatives that they've, that they've added to this, that they've designed in the lab in order to make the food try to last longer. With Again, with good intentions, but without the proper understanding that we just need to eat what God has made. And there are methods of preservation that where we can use things that God has used, like salt, for example. That's why salt has been used for a real long time. I mean, God created salt. Man didn't create that. There are things that, that God has given us all the tools that we need in order to, to be healthy, in order to survive, in order to eat healthy. So when you, you know, as a general, when you look at ingredients, when you start seeing stuff that's just like, I don't have no idea what that is, or when you start seeing the ingredients list as being really long, it's probably not good for you. Now, turn if you would to Proverbs chapter 31. Proverbs chapter 31. Proverbs 31 is real famous about the, the virtuous woman. We're going to see some, some real, uh, just some good bits of wisdom here. Because one of the big problems with, with people eating unhealthy is the, is the desire to have fast food. And to have convenient food. So, it's not just, I mean, the McDonald's, the Burger Kings, these places where they, they, they tell you, man, come in, we'll get you your food fast. You could be in and out. You don't have to worry about wasting time cooking a meal and preparing stuff. Hey, look, you're on the go. You're a busy person. You need to eat right now. You can eat and you can go. And that's the way our society has become. You know, we become more and more busy. We've got so many things to do that we can't be bothered with all these other things. And we start to, to give them less importance in our life. And unfortunately, when it comes to the food, what we, we, we end up suffering in the long run. In the short term, you don't see it. In the short term, hey, I've got this, this, this rumbling in my belly. I'm hungry. There's a food place right there. I could go. I could get my food. I could be in and out of there in five minutes and be on my way. And they'll, just, they'll give it to me. Boom. Eat it. That's satisfied. Now I can keep focusing on my work. The problem is with, this, with the convenient food, the fast food, the frozen foods that are like, you know, that most of the, you know, the, the hungry man meals and all the other stuff that they have, they add all the preservatives. They, they could sit in the shelf for a while, not just because they're frozen, but because they're loaded with the preservatives. And it's designed to be this convenient, easy, fast food. Well, we see something a little bit different in Proverbs 31 when it comes to how the virtuous woman prepares 
her food. It says in um, verse number 14, and this is talking a little bit more probably about the price. It says, she is like the merchant ship. She bringeth her food from afar. So she's bringing her food from a far place. You know, with the merchant ships, when there's less middlemen, you don't have to pay as much for your food. So I believe that's what this is more talking about. But she's putting an importance on the food that she's getting. You know, she gets her food from afar. Look at verse 15, though. She riseth also while it is yet night and giveth meat to her household and a portion to her maidens. So the reason why she's rising while it's yet night is because in order to prepare a good meal, it takes time. It, 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 it definitely is an investment of your time in order to make things from scratch, in order to make things using what God has given us. You know, and, and, and when you, when, I know this firsthand from my wife. I mean, I see the, the, she makes great home-cooked meals, but it takes her. I mean, it, it takes like a significant part of the day just to get all those meals prepared for the family. So in order to do that, the virtuous woman, hey, she wakes up early. So before everyone else is even awake, she gets started on that. She gets that work going so that when they do get up and they need food for the day, hey, they've got a nice, healthy, nutritious meal to go. Here you go. You can eat this. And you could, you could, this will sustain you throughout the day. It takes time. You know, I, I'll steal from, from the, the Heinz ketchup, right? The Bible. Or the Bible the, Heinz, Heinz says the best things come to those who wait. And you know what? There's truth to that. There's wisdom to that. Anything that's worth doing, for example, it's going to take some time. It takes a time investment. In order for this, this church, if this church is going to be a great church and a solid church, guess what? It's going to take some time. It's not going to be one of these churches that just shoots up overnight like a weed in the ground that just shoots up real big and is gone then in, in, in a day. When the heat comes, it just gets knocked over. If we're going to be solid and founded, just like a seed and a plant and what God has given to us to eat, those seeds, they take time. You don't just plant in the ground and then the next day you wake up and be like, oh cool, here's my breakfast, I'm ready to eat. That's not the way it works. They take time. Everything that's worth doing is going to take some time. Sit in your chair and don't move. Everything's going to take some time. We see here the virtuous woman. It says, She considereth a field, in verse 16, and buyeth it with the fruit of her hand. She planteth a vineyard. So here she's using, again, she's using what God has done and what God has given her to use her hands in order to, um, to produce that. Now turn, if you would, to um, Proverbs 27. You're in Proverbs 31. I'm going to read for you from Exodus chapter 3. We're going to look at some foods that the Bible says are, are used in a good mention and a good light. There have been so many fad diets that come and go. You know, I remember growing up as a kid. I, I, I'm 38 years old. When, when I was growing up, you'd hear different things. And I specifically remember, I mean, there'd be like ads on TV telling you like, you know, that, that eggs aren't that good for you. You know, it's high in cholesterol and you have all these things and that, you know, Butter is not good for you. And they came out with, I can't believe it's not butter and margarine and all these other substitutes. So you can still try to get that taste, but butter, stay away from butter. It's bad for you. That's not something you should be eating. And these things, they come and go. And then later on, they go, oh, actually, it was good for you, you know, the whole time. There wasn't a problem with that. And, and the science changes every five years or every 10 years. They're coming out with some new thing and some new diets. And you got the Weight Watchers and you got the, the Atkins diet, right? It says, well, you can't eat any bread. You can't eat, you know, you can only eat meat and protein. And that's it. And like nothing else. And look, they're all unbalanced and are unhealthy. These, these fad diets, if we could just stick with what the Bible says, I'm going to read for you just a few things that, you know, maybe the world's going to tell you these things aren't good for you to eat. Don't eat these things. Well, if God says that they're good, then I'm going to believe the Bible. I'm going to say, you know what? These things are good. And I'm going to eat them. In Exodus chapter 3, you're in Proverbs 27. Stay there. Exodus 3, 7, the Bible says, And the Lord said, I have surely seen the affliction of my people which are in Egypt. Abigail, sit up straight in your chair. And have heard their cry by reason of their taskmasters, for I know their sorrows. And I am come down to deliver them out of the hand of the Egyptians and to bring them up out of the land unto a good land, right? This is talking about God taking them, the, the children of Israel out of Egypt, bringing them to a good land, unto a land flowing with milk and honey. So right off the bat, we see milk and honey. Very good things. It's a good land. It produces good things. And those good things are milk and honey that are being produced. There's nothing wrong with drinking milk as opposed to what the vegan might tell you. Milk is just fine. 
and honey is good too. And we're going to get a little bit more into honey in a little bit. Proverbs 27, verse 26, the Bible says, the lambs are for thy clothing. See, God has provided everything we need. You shear a lamb, you shear a sheep, you get the wool and you can make clothing out of that. That's what he's given them for, to us for. We have dominion over the animals. The lambs are for thy clothing and the goats are for the price of the field. And thou shalt have goat's milk enough for thy food, for the food of thy household and for the maintenance of thy maidens. There's nothing wrong. And people say, oh, it's so bizarre. Why would you drink animals' milk? Like, that's just for the animals. I said, look, God has given us those animals. Yes, they feed their young with that, but that's also for human consumption also. There is nothing wrong or weird about a human drinking cow's milk or goat's milk or something like that. God has given that to us for food. And that's what we see here in Proverbs 27. The Bible says in, in Matthew 6, 11, and as part of the Lord's Prayer, give us this day our daily bread, right? Real familiar. A lot of people know that phrase. This is talking about eating bread every day. So sorry, Atkins. You know, I'm going to stick with the Bible. If the Bible's saying eat the daily bread, hey, God, give us our bread every day. Bread's good for you. Now, Again, we, we live in a, in, a, in a world where things have been modified and changed and there's all this stuff. I'm not talking about the Wonder Bread. I'm not talking about the 99 cent loaf of bread that you could get from Fry's or from any of the grocery stores here. You know, I used to get those before I had any knowledge or understanding. I think, oh, wow, this is great. This is so cheap. I get all this bread and it's going to last me a long time. Yeah, it lasts a long time. It lasts a really long time. You get that 99 cent Wonder Bread or whatever, it's a wonder. What's a wonder it stays so long? You know, the wonder is because of what they load in there. That's not bread. That's not real food. They load it with all kinds of preservatives and they bleach it to make the color, you know, all these different things. You don't want to be ingesting that stuff. Now, bread is a perfect example. In order to make bread, that takes time. That takes effort. But the time that gets put into it, you're going to get much more value out of what you're eating and, and, and real nutrition, the bread that Jesus is talking about, that's good for your body is going to be stuff that's made that's not easily you know made and just cooked up and is loaded with preservatives but it's 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 good for you the bible says in mark 9 50 you don't have to turn there turn if you would to proverbs 25 we're going to i'm going to keep you in proverbs because there's still some more wisdom we're going to gain from the book of proverbs but in in, in mark 9 50 jesus said salt is good but if the salt have lost his saltness, wherewith will ye season it? Have salt in yourselves and have peace one with another. Again, you know, I've heard over and over again, salt is bad for you. It's going to raise your blood pressure. It's going to do all this other stuff. Look, the Bible says salt is good. Now, we'll keep this in mind as we get to the next point in Proverbs 25. These things I'm mentioning are good, but you never want to go overboard on anything. You never want to get overindulgent on salt, on honey, on milk, on any of these things. You need to strike the balance that's good for you in your life. If you overdo anything, it's not going to be good for you. It's going to end up overdoing it. You're going to overload your body with that goodness and it's going to become excess and it's, and it's not going to be healthy for you. Now, Isaiah 7, 14, talking about a prophecy about Jesus Christ, you're in Proverbs 25. Isaiah 14, 7, 14 says, Therefore the Lord himself shall give you a sign. Behold, a virgin shall conceive and bear a son and shall call his name Emmanuel. Butter and honey shall he eat that he may know to refuse the evil and choose the good. Butter and honey are good things that the Lord Jesus Christ ate. And the reason why he was given the good things is that when you know what, what good tastes like, then you can sense, okay, this is evil. I'm going to refuse the evil. And it's, ama it's amazing, you know, how un my, my life, my eating habits have been really unhealthy for a long time. And I am not the, the, a health nut. I do not eat as healthy as I probably even should right now. I'll just be honest with you. But I did make significant changes in my diet Be after learning this stuff. You know, the high fructose corn syrup, this modified sh sugars and stuff that, that, that I was ingesting just through soda. Insane amounts. You don't even realize. You drink it because it tastes good. It's just like, oh yeah, this tastes good. It's sweet. This, this, this is great for me. It's not good for you. It's terrible for you. And the, the fast food that I was eating, when I decided, you know what? I'm getting rid of all of this fast food, the McDonald's, the Burger Kings, the Taco Bells, and then getting rid of the, the, the sodas. After, I don't know, a couple months maybe of doing that, when I go back, like now when I go back, to, if, I, if I ever would to do that, I, and I, I wouldn't right now, but there have been times where I'm like, 
reminiscing on those days of like, man, I would love to just have a Whopper right now, right? Or to have this, this chicken sandwich or whatever it is. And I'd go back and eat those. My stomach starts to turn, literally turn. It's, and it's not just because it's something, it's a psychological thing. No, it's a physical effect of that, of that grease and just that, that, that bad food. When your body is used to eating healthy, normal food, and then you eat stuff like that, it'll physically make you sick. The problem is that over time, when you ingest this stuff, your body gets used to it. And so you're not able to discern the good from the bad. But when you're only introducing good stuff in your body, you'll be able to learn to, 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 to choose the good and to refuse the evil. And the evil just means that's what's bad for your body. And um, it's if anyone's done this before, you'll see. And if you haven't done this before, I challenge you to try to do this and try to eat just what God has given us. Just the good stuff. The stuff that where you can see the ingredients list is all natural things. It's all things that God has made. If you know, There's nothing wrong with a chicken pot pie. You can have like all these different ingredients in it if they're all just corn and peas and chicken and you know chicken broth. Like the stuff that's just natural that God's made. Hey, that's great. Just stay away from the frozen stuff that's got all the preservatives in it. But, um, you know, these types of meals, they're good for you. And if you can stick to only eating that and then you go back and eat some of this stuff that's garbage, your body will tell you, this isn't good for me. I don't want to eat this stuff. Don't do this again, please. You're in Proverbs 25, verse 16. So we've seen, you know, milk, honey, goat's milk, salt, butter, all things mentioned in the Bible are good things. There's nothing wrong with these inherently. They're not bad in and of themselves. They're actually referred to as being good. Proverbs 25, look at verse 16. He says, Hast thou found honey? Eat so much as is sufficient for thee, lest thou be filled therewith and vomited. So he's saying, you need to eat just the right amount. And honey is a perfect example because it's so sweet and it tastes so good. And it's, you know, it's yummy. Like, man, I really want to have a lot of honey. My kids love honey. But you shouldn't overdo it because when you overdo it, your body's going to expel it and say, this is too much. Your body has a mechanism built in to say, yeah, you've, you've made me sick. This is, this is more than the body can handle or needs. And you'll vomit it up. And as with all of the other good things that we've mentioned, we need to only consume what is sufficient for us. Now, everybody's body is a little bit different. God's designed our bodies to work generally the same way. But through sin and through other consequences of our life and through other decisions that we've made, different parts of our bodies may have deteriorated in different ways. And people, where you're at right now in your life, maybe salt isn't a good thing for you. Even though the Bible says they're good, there are people that can get to the point to where, hey, these things aren't good for you anymore. But usually it's a result of, of, of things you've done in the past already. You've all, you, you know, you, if you would have started off on the right path, hey, all this stuff would still be good. But we make decisions in our life. Sometimes we make poor decisions. And sometimes other things happen. And I don't want to get into all the, the different reasons and details why things can change over time. But we can get to a point to where... All of a sudden, maybe something that normally would be good isn't good for you anymore. So keep that in mind for your individual health. That what I'm saying right now is, you know, if you've got this serious problem in your life and, and you really ought not to be eating salt because you have real problems with your blood pressure, look, that may be a result of something that's happened earlier, but don't just be like, well, all of a sudden salt's good and I'm just going to start eating. You know, Take your individual life, you know, to, to, for, your, for your own benefit, and we need to take all this with a grain of salt. <laughs> take it all so that, so that you can apply it appropriately to your life. I'm just trying to provide some wisdom from the Bible here, and you take that how you're going to, to provide the, um, for your own health. Uh, Proverbs 25, you're there, jump down to verse 27, says, It is not good to eat much honey. So... Everything needs to be taken in its appropriate sufficiency level. Uh, you're in Proverbs 25. Flip back to Proverbs 23. Because, you know, we ought not to be overeating. You know, even, even good things. You say, everything I eat is good. Well, you still shouldn't overeat. You still shouldn't be a glutton. You shouldn't just consume so much just because it tastes good and giving into that. I love food. I think it's great. I, I, one of my favorite qualities of my wife, I mean, I, I love her spirit and her soul and her mind and all the things that, that, that make her who she is, but she is an excellent cook and, and I love the food that she makes, but as much as I love that, I, I need to make sure that I don't overdo it and just overeat and just fill, 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 fill because then 
you know, it's not good. It's not healthy. It's not good for my body. I'll end up getting fat and I'll end up, you know, causing too much stress on my body. I need to just stick with what has been, um, what is required for my body to function properly. Verse uh, 21 of Proverbs 23, the Bible says, For the drunkard and the glutton shall come to poverty, and drowsiness shall clothe a man with rags. So, you know, and this is talking about coming to poverty. I covered this about a week or two ago, but... Um, we don't want to be glut gluttons and we definitely don't want to be drunkards. Now, I want to bring up real quickly this point about drinking alcohol. You're in Proverbs 23. Jump down to verse 29. The Bible says, Who hath woe, who hath sorrow, who hath contentions, who hath babbling, who hath wounds without cause, who hath redness of eyes. And look, none of these things are things that you want. You don't want to have woe. You don't want to be sorrow. You don't want to have fightings, which is contentions. You don't want to be babbling and just saying stupid things and everyone looks at you like you're an idiot because you're just babbling. You don't want to have wounds without cause that you have no idea. You got hurt. Like, man, I got hurt. I have no idea where this came from. And the redness of eyes. Now, who has all these things? The Bible says, they that tarry long at the wine, they that go to seek mixed wine. People go and drink alcohol. This happens to, to them. These are the, the effects of what's going to happen when you drink alcohol. It says, verse 31, Look not thou upon the wine when it is red, when it giveth his color in the cup, when it moveth itself aright. Now, real briefly, there's, there's wine that's mentioned in the Bible. And according to the context, you can understand whether it's talking about the juice that gets, that's received from the fruit or whether that, that drink has been fermented and has become alcohol, an alcoholic beverage. And I preach an entire sermon about this called Their Wine Versus Our Wine. And it is very clear. See, there's a lot of Christians that are getting confused about this because there's people deceiving and saying, oh, well, drinking in moderation is just fine. And it's not fine. And kids especially, listen up. Drinking alcohol is not fine. It's not okay. It's never good. Don't let someone tell you, oh, you could just have, you can have one beer, one glass of wine, and that's fine. No. Alcohol is a poison. Alcohol is what causes these things to happen that we just read. It's going to make you sad. People say, oh, no, no. Everyone, that's why everyone drinks at a party so they can have a fun time, and it looks like everyone's having a great time. That's a, that's a deception. That's a lie. It may look fun at the moment, but look at all those people the next day. It's not nearly as fun as it looked the night before. Not even close. It's going to bring you sadness and sorrow. The Bible says that at the last, so in the, at the beginning it might look fun. In verse number 32 it says, At the last it biteth like a serpent. Does anyone here want to get bit by a snake? That doesn't sound like much fun to me. Get bit by a rattlesnake? That's what alcohol is going to do. It's going to bite like a, like a snake does, and it stingeth like an adder. It says, Thine eyes shall behold strange women, and thine heart shall utter perverse things. When you get drunk, you're just going to start to look at people that you shouldn't be looking at in a way you shouldn't be looking at them, and your heart is going to utter perverse means perverted. You're going to, your heart's going to start thinking things that, that you should never be thinking that are unholy, that are not good, that... that and this is what alcohol will lead you into, doing these things. It's not something that's good for you. And the reason why is because it's a poison. Turn, if you would, to Deuteronomy chapter 32. Alcoholic wine is poison. I mean, the world will even tell you that alcohol is poison. It's not something that's good for your body. So why would you want to ingest a poison? Deuteronomy chapter 32, verse 31. Deuteronomy 32, verse 31 says, For their rock is not as our rock, even our enemies themselves being judges. For their vine is of the vine of Sodom and of the fields of Gomorrah. Their grapes are grapes of gall. Their clusters are bitter. Their wine is the poison of dragons and the cruel venom of asps. This is referring to the heathen, to the unsaved world, saying that their wine, the wine that they drink, is different than the wine that we drink as believers in Christ, as believers in the Lord. Their wine is different. They drink the poison. They drink the alcoholic wine. The wine that we drink, it's pure. It doesn't have poison in it. It's, it's, it's the, the, the pure blood of the grape. 
the fruit that, that comes, that you could squeeze juice. We, we squeeze orange juice. We used to all the time when we would go to, to my wife's grandmother's house. She has orange trees in Phoenix. And we would go and pick the oranges and we would make orange juice. And man, was that stuff good. <laughs> I've never had better orange juice than the orange juice that we picked and hand squeezed from, from her house. That stuff tasted so great. And you know, the Bible says that wine makes the heart merry. Our hearts were merry when we go and get that orange juice. I'll tell you what, the, the kids loved it. We all loved it. It's, it's just really tasty and really enjoyable to get that juice. And, um, but that's different. That's not the wine that the world wants. The world wants to go out to the bar and get the poison because it makes them feel different. It makes them drunk. They like getting that buzz. And look, I was part of that. I understand what that's like. But I'll tell you right now, it's a deception, it's a fraud. It's only going to bring sorrow, it's only going to bring woe, it's only going to bring uh, problems in your life. And if you want to live healthy and eat healthy, stay away from the alcohol. It's not good for you. Now, speaking about overdoing it, I kind of briefly mentioned the, um, I'm almost done here. Turn, if you would, to Leviticus 25. It's the last place I'll have you turn. Leviticus 25. I just mentioned juicing and drinking juice. Juice is one of those things that you can also overdo it with. And the reason being is because if you, you know, anyone who's juiced their own stuff knows that the, the amount of, of uh, fruit or whatever you're using to create that juice, like, like when we would do orange, orange juice, the amount of juice you get from one orange is not that much. You get like, like if you're putting in a glass, you get like this little, this little sip of juice from this orange. So you need to go through a lot of oranges in order to get like a, you know, it's a nice glass of orange juice. And we would, we would juice a lot. We would get tons of oranges. The trees were bountiful and we would freeze it and all this other stuff. But that's beside the point. The amount of juice that you get is real small. And another good rule of thumb to use for being healthy, because there's also these juicing diets that are out there. Where, where people will try to be health conscious and say, okay, well, I'm going to, you know, I don't like all the, the different tastes of vegetables and stuff like that. So I'm going to juice it together with fruit juice and other things. And I'm going to get all my nutrition that way. And again, I'm not against those things. And if you want to do that, that's fine. But a little bit of wisdom, I would say, is to make sure that you don't overdo it. Because you can overdo it even just with orange juice. You know, you think about what you would normally eat to, to get that nutrition. When you juice things, because it's so small, I wouldn't drink more, especially if it's a part of your regular diet. See, juice isn't designed to be something that's part of your regular diet that you drink every single day. Just because of how much has to go into it. And that's why, you know, all throughout the Bible, when you see the good references to juice, they use it on good occasions, on special occasions, on the, the wedding feast. When Jesus Christ turned water into wine, hey, there's a special occasion. We're going we're gonna to be a little bit more luxurious because, you know, it requires all of these oranges or all of these grapes or all these whatever to make that juice. You need a lot more of abundance in order to create that. It's a special treat. It's something you can say, hey, I'm going to have a really nice glass of juice. That's great, but it's not something you do every day. So if you are going to do something, know where you're going to do an every day's worth of, of drinking instead of eating, one rule of thumb that, that would be just a little bit of wisdom is say, well, how much would I normally eat? If I were to sit down and eat this many potatoes, or you know, potatoes probably isn't a good example. I don't think anyone juices potatoes. But uh, uh, peas or something, I don't know, whatever. Like however much, what's that? Carrots. carrots. Okay, yeah, carrot, uh, juice carrots. How many carrots would I normally eat in a meal? And if you want to juice that, that's great. I think you know, you'll get the proper nutrition that way. Or maybe a little bit more because you lose some of it. You know. but, but just keep that in mind when you do that so that you're not just saying, okay, well, in order to get a full glass of carrot juice, I need to squeeze you know, like two bags of carrots or something. That's more than you would ever eat. You're going to be overdoing it for your body and you're going to be introducing more than what your body is ready to handle. So just always you know, keep that in mind with the juicing and stuff. And like I said, like any of these, most of these things, I'm not just completely against it. We just need to have the wisdom in, in using it um, appropriately. And even the fast food, you know, like I'm against, I'm against the, the really fast food stuff, like, like completely, like I don't ever eat it at a lot of places. But if you eat something like every once in a while, I don't think it's just going to give you cancer and kill you. 
You know, I mean, there's, there's times, like, especially if you go over to somebody's house and they're giving you a meal, and then maybe it's something that you wouldn't normally eat, you sit down and you, you shut your mouth and you be thankful for what they've given to you. You know, the Bible says when Jesus sent them out, he says, whatsoever they put in front of you, that eat, you know, ask of nothing. You don't ask about it, you just eat it. You say, hey, they're being gracious, they're being kind to you, they're giving you some food, you eat that food and, and you thank them for it, even if it's something that you wouldn't normally eat. You be something, you know, if, if I go over to a friend's house and they've bought this big McDonald's feast, <laughs> you know, I, I might not eat very much, but I'm going to, you know, because it's not going to kill you, right? I mean, it's not like it's just pure poison or you just, as soon as you take one bite, you're just going to fall over dead. <laughs> All right. But we're talking about habits and the way that we want to live our life, you know, just in general going forward. And that's, that's, that's the wisdom we get. So you're in Leviticus 25. The last point as far as healthy eating and, and part of our diet is I'm going to cover just real briefly about vitamins and minerals. And this is something that I'm not an expert on. I have learned a little bit on, and I need to do more about this. I think this is something that's good for us today. And this is one part where I break a little bit from like, well, if you do, if you just eat what God's given you, then you're doing good. And that is true depending on where your source is coming from. One, because my last point here is that most of the produce that you get from the store comes from these big farms. Unfortunately, a lot, most of the food that you get, the, good, the things that you would consider to be good, say, this is what God has made and this is what's good for me, the practice that they used in farming has depleted the soil and the ground and the food of the proper nutrition that you ought to be getting from that food. So you're in Leviticus 25. We're going to see, see, God, if we could just follow what God has given us for an example, we would be just fine. There would be so much less problems in the world. Leviticus 25, we're just going to read this real briefly. God's design for planting crops and, and reaping those crops. Look at verse number 3, Leviticus 25. The Bible says, Six years thou shalt sow thy field, and six years thou shalt prune thy vineyard, and gather in the fruit thereof. But in the seventh year shall be a Sabbath of rest unto the land, a Sabbath for the Lord. Thou shalt neither sow thy field nor prune thy vineyard. That which groweth of its own accord of thy harvest thou shalt not reap. Neither gather the grapes of thy vine undressed, for it is a year of rest unto the land. And the Sabbath of the land shall be meat for you, for thee and for thy servant, and for thy maid, and for thy hired servant, and for thy stranger that sojourneth with thee, and for thy cattle, and for the beasts that are in thy land, shall all the increase thereof be meat. And thou shalt number seven Sabbaths of years unto thee, seven times seven years. And the space of the seven Sabbaths of years shall be unto thee forty and nine years." Then shalt thou cause the trumpet of the jubilee to sound on the tenth day of the seventh month. In the day of atonement shall ye make the trumpet sound throughout all your land. And ye shall hallow the fiftieth year and proclaim liberty throughout all the land unto all the inhabitants thereof. It shall be a jubilee unto you. And ye shall return every man unto his possession. And ye shall return every man unto his family. A jubilee shall that fiftieth year be unto you. Ye shall not sow, neither reap that which groweth of itself in it, nor gather the grapes in it of thy vine undressed, for it is the jubilee. It shall be holy unto you. Ye shall eat the increase thereof out of the field. So he's explaining here the land needs a rest. So every seventh year, you, you, could, you, could, you can grow, you can cultivate, you can do six years, you plant, you reap, you, you, you plow the ground, you do everything you need to do, you, you gather all the food out, and, 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 and you do all that business, right, of, of, of working the land and, and, and getting the food out of the land. But then he says, on the seventh year, let it rest. Let it grow. Don't go out there and reap. You know, you can pick something off of it and eat it, but you don't, you don't reap it and, and gather everything in. You let it stay up there. You let it fall. Because that stuff is going to go back, it's going to compost, it's going to get back into the ground, you know, and, and the ground needs to rest because you've been draining all of the nutrition out of it. These nutrients and these minerals are coming out of the ground and the land needs to rest. And then he's saying on the 50th year, so also the 49th and 50th, and the 50th year is a jubilee, it rests basically for two years because every seventh year you get to the 49th year, that's a, land, a, a year of rest. 
And then also the same as on the 50th year, it's the year of Jubilee. So God is ordained. And look, he doesn't explain all of the reasons behind doing it. See, the reasons are there. And the reasons are there for God's commandments. The reasons are there. You know, you, you can understand the more you study them, the reasons why God says it, but we just need to take God on faith. That's what he asks us. Just say, hey, look, just believe me. Look, I'm telling you that this is the way you need to do it. This is the way you need to do it. Now, if you want to study why things are that way and the reasoning behind it, that's great. There's nothing wrong with that. But we just need to take God for his word. And when God's talking about this with the land and giving it rest, there's good reason behind that. And we ought to just be able to take it by faith. But his reason is because, look, and, and this, is, this is common knowledge in, in agriculture. And that's why people will use different methods and they'll have certain areas that they'll let rest and other areas that they'll cultivate so that you can always have something coming in. So you have, okay, this land, it's time for this land to rest, but we're, we're growing over here. And they'll mix and cross like, like we've been growing a certain food, you know, uh, for this many years. We're going to switch it out now and plant this over here and plant something else over there. And, and it all makes sense, but... The reason why I bring all this up, you know, is because a lot of farmers, all they care about is getting that big yield every single year. I mean, we look at it today, like that's why businesses used to be closed on the weekends or used to be closed on Sunday, used to be closed, but they found they could just make more money by staying open an extra day instead of giving that rest to their employees or, you know, we're going to do better with a little bit of rest. You know, I'm a hard worker. I like to work a lot. But if I overdo it, if I'm just working all the time, my work overall is going to suffer. It's not going to be as good as if I would have just gotten a little bit of rest. If I would have just taken the time and just said, okay, I need a break. I need, to just, I need to just rest a little bit and then get back and hit it hard and work 12 hour days and do whatever I need to do. But you need that rest. The, the, the ground needs the rest too. So the food that you eat, you might think it's doing really good for you because, hey, I'm eating, I'm eating vegetables. You know, I'm eating corn. I'm eating, I'm eating Brussels sprouts. I'm eating all this stuff. But if you're getting it from a farmer, from a, from a source, where they don't take the, the land getting rest into, into consideration, the, the ground that it's growing from is going to be starved of all the nutrition that you are getting that you put into your body. And this is where, I, like I said, I'll stray a little bit from just the, 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 the basic concept of if you do eat what God's giving you, you're going to do well. You might need to supplement your diet with getting a little bit more minerals and vitamins that, are going to, that would normally be in the food if it was done right. But now you need to add a little bit extra because you're not getting what your body was designed to receive. And that's a whole other thing. You need to look into that. There's cheap vitamins and expensive ones. And they, you know, some of them, they source their vitamins from, from rocks and inorganic material. And they'll say, hey, this has this substance in it. But you have to look and say, well, where is it actually coming from? Because that might be useless for your body depending on the source of where you're getting it from. There's all kinds of things. And unfortunately, there's, for that, I don't have an easy answer for you. That's just going to require some time and effort on your part to look that up for yourself. But I bring it up just so that you won't be ignorant. I was ignorant of a lot of this stuff for a really long time. God wants us to be healthy. He's designed our bodies a certain way in an amazing way. And we can adapt and overcome a lot of this stuff, but we, we, see, we don't want to pay the consequences later on in our life. We don't want to, we, we want I want to make the most out of my life, out of the years that I have on this earth, whatever those years may be, I don't want to spend the latter half of my life in a hospital room or just completely down and out or, or, or bedridden because I've gotten cancer, because I've got these diseases that are eating away at my body or that's going to kill me prematurely. What we put into our body is really important. We need to make sure that we put the appropriate time and emphasis on that food. And if it takes a little bit longer to make it, in the long run, it'll be worth it. If you have to spend maybe a little bit more money on it, hey, in the long run, it's going to be worth it. Let's bow our eyes and have a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you so much for your amazing creation. We thank you for the wisdom that we could find in the Bible, dear Lord. We thank you for um, providing us the food and, and the food that amazingly just grows out of the ground and all we have to do is just do a little bit of work to cultivate it and, and, and reap it dear lord but that that you provided sustenance for us that that grows directly out of the earth 
and, uh, and from these animals, dear Lord. I pray that you would please just um, help us to be wise when it comes to deciding how, how our habits are going to be in our eating. Dear Lord, we, we want to serve you to the utmost. We want our bodies to be fully functioning um, uh, properly according to the way that you've designed them, dear God. And I pray that you would please just grant us that wisdom. Help us not to be deceived by, by the people that are just out the they're for the love of money and are willing to make a quick buck off of us and don't care about us and don't care about our health. Dear Lord, help us to be wise to that deception that's out there and that we can just live a, a healthy life, dear Lord, and, and eat food that is good, that is based off of what you've created for us. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. One other point, I meant to get to this, actually, and I don't want to forget it. The food, the animal, the meat that you eat. Remember I said everything that you eat, you are what you eat. When you eat meat, like beef, for example, what that food that that animal eats becomes a part of its meat. So if, if you eat food from animals that are eating this genetically modified, you say you may not be eating genetically modified food, but if you're eating beef or something off of an animal that's eating that genetically modified food, it will transfer to you also. So just be aware of that. Like, there's a lot of things. You know, we try to go organic as much as possible, but even with the labeling and all this other stuff, there's always people out to trick you. You don't always know what you're getting. If possible, the best way would be to have your own farm, grow your own food, have your own animals, and you know for sure what's going into what they're eating, and that would be awesome. But I know that not everybody has that capability. So if you don't, and you live in the area, though, there are a lot of people in the area that do have that, and they sell you know, their eggs and milk and, and, and beef and things like that. And if you can do so, my suggestion would be and if, if, you're, if you have the financial means to do it, at least a little bit, try to buy a local from someone that you know is, 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 is aware of the problems and the consequences of, of the GMO stuff and, and the non-natural stuff. And, and that's, that's one more piece of advice for you this morning. But, uh